Yeah, so my name is uh, Ben Fjorn Kromut, and I was the director and producer of Havana Motor Club. And what year did you graduate? I graduated from the School of the Arts in 07. So, um, tell us a little bit about your time at Columbia. You were there for three or four years in the, in the grad school, right? I was actually there for all five years. I took my time there and, uh, and didn't want to rush anything because I ended up doing a non-thesis and a thesis project. Uh, but I did spend almost a year in Congo during my, my five years in Columbia, so I was out of New York a lot. Um, and then and then I did my thesis film also in Congo. But but yeah, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to make this film if it weren't for my education there. And, and the way I approach documentaries is very much through a, a character-driven, story-driven manner rather than as a journalist. And ironically, I never took one documentary class at Columbia but to me, a story is a story, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, and 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 I really learned how to, you know, tell a dramatic story visually uh, through my experience at Columbia. So, how did you start with getting into documentaries? You got out of school, uh, looking at more traditional narrative structure, making films. Well, my first year of Columbia. Um, I interned with a company that ended up uh, producing a film called Control Room, which was about the media coverage during the war in Iraq. And uh, my role there went from intern to producer of the film, and I was also one of the editors of it. And so I had an experience of making a, a feature-length documentary while being in class at Columbia, which I, I feel grateful for because Whatever I was learning in class, I was able to apply to the film, and what I was learning on on the shoot, I was able to bring to the classroom. So it was a very nice uh, sort of uh, uh, cohesion of, of learning and also uh, practicing filmmaking. Is there one specific skill you remember learning in Dodge that you could apply to this film, to solving any specific problems in this film? Yeah, I mean, particularly my screenwriting classes, I feel like... Um, Learning about you know who my characters are, you know what's what they want above everything, and and what are the obstacles that prevent them from getting that want. That's really what I um, I used as a model for when I was editing the film. We had many many characters. I think we had ten total characters, but I wanted to choose characters who had very different wants. Um, otherwise, there's no reason to have that many characters. And so I have four different characters who I would just ask myself, what does he want above everything else? And how is he going to get that want? And luckily in this film, all the, the d wants sort of converged uh, in the, f the final scene of the film, which, which we were very lucky to have captured. So, Can you tell me a little bit, a bit about finding the moment where you found the ending for the documentary, like that aha moment? Yeah. Well, you know, the film at first was going to be a simple story about how these Cuban drag racers were preparing for the first uh, official car race since the Cuban Revolution. And it was only supposed to be a six-week shoot, and uh, it was going to be a very classic competition-style film. And the, the central question or the conflict was who was going to win the race. But welcome to Cuba, where nothing is certain, and uh, the race kept on getting postponed. And we waited for over a year for the race to happen. And I always thought, you know, there was a big chance the race was never going to happen and that it was going to be a sort of waiting for Godot story of Cubans waiting for something that never really happens. And we, we filmed about 140 hours of them with the assumption that the race was never going to happen. But then the race was announced and, and we thought maybe there is a chance that it's going to happen. It was postponed again. And, once again, we were sure it wasn't going to happen. And then on the day of the race, we still didn't think it was going to happen because they didn't really prepare for the race in the way that you know would allow them to have a safe race. And without spoiling the ending, I think the minute that the race did happen, we knew that we had a story. and We knew that we could anchor the rest of the 300 hours of footage that we ended up shooting in the ending of the film. And I think... You know, the advice I give many filmmakers, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, is, you know, try to figure out your ending as soon as possible, but also be flexible with the ending changing. Right. Kind of be open to that storytelling you what it is. Yeah. And, and, and so the central question for our film became not who's going to win the race, but will the race happen? And so we really shifted the whole narrative once once we realized that the race was may or might not ever happen. Right. Right. Um, I guess I have one more question for you. 
Um, what do you think Diana Vreeland would say about these drag racers in Cuba? Well, it's funny because I, I was a co-director and an editor on Diana Vreeland, and I was also an editor on the Valentino movie. Well, and, thank you. And for this, for this project, I was really, and I also did a film in Congo about female uh, uh, rape survivors. Um, so I've been very female centric for my previous documentaries, and this one I felt was, you know, very macho. There were not v the most attractive characters, but in a way, it's m even more stylish than any of my previous films because Cuba is very in vogue right now, and these cars are beautiful pieces of art um, that have been on the streets in Cuba since the 50s. And not only are they preserving these cars, they're racing them. So I think. Diana Vreeland would be very excited about the, the sexiness of this film because, you know, car racing in Cuba is, is a very sexy topic right now.